Okay, here we are. Welcome back. <laughs> well, to me, welcome back to YouTube. I'm sure you've been here the whole time. Um, yeah, so, oh my God. I feel like I've shifted timelines. Um, a lot has happened. I think I haven't posted since probably before the Harvey Weinstein trial. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about today. We're going to give you guys a little life update and uh, some things from the trial that were interesting that I didn't talk about on Instagram or TikTok. Um, and some of those things are a little bit more on the spiritual side. So I guess let's start with I mean, my experience and kind of spirituality woven into my experience. So uh, the first day that I went to the trial, I actually went for the pre-trial. So that was a good experience because there wasn't a whole media frenzy there for the pre-trial. So I was able to, I was the only member of the public who was even trying to get in. And then there was one pool reporter who was just covering the pre-trial. Um, it was... So it was basically, okay, I get there on the first day of the trial and um, it's like the trial hasn't really begun yet. It's the pre-trial, they just are doing jury selection and when the jury is not there, they go over some of the evidence that they want excluded from the trial that they don't want the jury to see. So this is a really interesting time to go because actually a lot of the things that I wrote down that day came into play later, um, which we could talk about maybe now, maybe in another video. I have talked a little bit about that. Um, but what I wanna really talk about is like, so that first day and also the first day, the real first day when all the reporters were there, I was the first one, of course, um, because when you're out there on your own, you gotta make sure you get there first. So, both days in the morning, the first time that I went alone and then the first time that I went and everyone was there, I was listening to Wayne Dyer, Real Magic on the way. And that Wayne Dyer, Real Magic, it's like, I guess it was like a seminar that is, you know, just gonna have a sip of my kombucha here. You know, we're not sponsored by Health Aid, but we should be. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was listening to Wayne Dyer and I just love him so much. Uh, I didn't used to, I used to hear a lot of like the spiritual people talk about Wayne Dyer, how he was someone that they looked up to and I never really got into it. But what one of the things that Wayne talks about is how the teachers are always there. They're always available. It's when you're ready for them is when they present themselves. So the example that he gives is like, you know, the Bhagavad Gita was written, I don't know, 5,000 years ago. Maybe that's, I don't know. Don't know where I got that number. Um, so that was a teacher that was available all that time for thousands of years, but it wasn't until he was ready to receive the information that that became his teacher. So as I'm listening to the Wayne Dyer real magic, I'm like, Wayne Dyer has been here the whole time. He's gone now. He's passed. But when I'm ready for this teaching, the teacher appears. So I was just like out in front of the courthouse at like five in the morning on those first days, like kind of like listening, get myself hyped up on this like real magic, like, you know, um, really beautiful. So then I go inside to the courthouse the first day um, and I'm super early. Um, because I didn't know who was going to be there, if it was going to be like a mob of media people. But thankfully it wasn't because I was a week early. And so I just roamed around and got like a good understanding of the courthouse and where I'm going and what rooms and okay, what floor, what do I have to do? What time does this happen? What, 
you know, that was actually great because when I went on the first day, it wasn't like I was a newbie there. I was there on the first day early, like, oh yeah, they'll let us in at this time. No, nah, it's okay. We can, you know, and that was like a really good position for me to be in because, uh, most of the people were from the actual media, like New York times, LA times writing for these different law and crime subscription services and variety and all everything, everything was there because there's also was on the ninth floor of the courthouse in LA. And this ninth floor is like famous. There's the OJ room, which I got to see inside. That's where the OJ trial took place. Um, down the hall, if you did follow the coverage on TikTok, um, down the hall was the Danny Masterson trial. Across the hall from the Harvey trial was the Stan Lee trial where this guy apparently stole all of Stanley's money. Um, I didn't know that was going on. On Halloween day, October 31st, for those of you that are international, um, when I was there <laughs> in, the, in the trial, um, also I met some very cool people, but House and Habit was sitting next to me. I love her. I don't know if you guys follow her on Instagram. I had been a fan of hers before meeting her that day. So I met her on the first day of the trial and I was like, oh, hey, I've been following you since your Glane coverage. Um, but, and I'll get more into like meeting friends and stuff. But I look over to her and I'm like, yo, what the hell is like Dracula doing here for the trial today? Cause this guy literally looked like Dracula in like disguise like in a black suit with like his hair dyed black. He just looked like Dracula. I realized when I saw my own um, LA Times article, well, not my own, I was featured in an LA Times article and they talked about how all this crazy stuff was happening on the ninth floor. And one of the things was the Stan Lee trial and the guy who stole all the money was the Dracula looking guy. He was sitting, imagine you're on trial for stealing someone's money and you're like, you know what? Let me just like roll across the hall real quick because they don't really need me right now. And I'm gonna go watch to see what happens um, in Harvey Weinstein's trial. How crazy. Um, it is crazy to see Harvey in person. Um, so I'll get to that. On the first day that I got there, I was the only member of the public. So I went to the second, like imagine like church pews is like kind of how it is. And it's like, I go to the second row and sit in the middle because I assume it's gonna like fill in and I'll have a good seat. Well, nobody else comes. So then sitting in the middle of the second pew just looks so awkward. So <clears throat> I'm dressed kind of like a paralegal, kind of like, you know, I'm assuming that they probably think I was like a law student or something on those first days before they had kind of figured it out. Um, but what was crazy is so then they wheel Harvey out in the wheelchair. And that was the first time, you know, that I had ever seen him in my life. But also, like, the media wasn't really there like that. So he didn't have a suit on. He was in his jail scrubs, looking a damn mess, like no haircut, no nothing, like just looking a goddamn mess, obviously, which was appropriate considering in the end, the one woman, the one Jane Doe that he was convicted on is the woman that she was basically in her hotel room about to get undressed and in a robe, about to take her makeup off. And then he showed up at her hotel room uninvited. So me kind of showing up that first day and he like turns around and kind of looks like, who the fuck is this fucking skinny blonde bitch? Like, <laughs> you know, okay. So, you know, he's, everyone, they're all kind of looking at me like, who is this bitch? Why is she here? Um, but, so this is some of the things I didn't get to talk about on TikTok that I really wanted to. And I was actually going to make a whole video about it, but then I was just like, I was like so tired of it already. It took like over two months of my life, that trial. By the end, I was just like, I don't want to anymore. I'm glad that I did it. 
Um, but one of the things that I did want to talk about that I didn't get to was um, about the bailiff. So the bailiff was a female, which she was a badass. She was, you know, she was probably, you know, my, uh, probably got to be my crush throughout the thing. Well, I had a couple. I also liked the, uh, the FBI agent. I loved the FBI agent. I was like, mm, he looks like me, myself, and Irene. Uh, also, I liked some guy that was on Harvey's team. I don't know why I'm all disclosing this, but there was like this guy that like, I don't know, sometimes like worked for Harvey's lawyers or what. I was like, damn, who's this fucking hot looking guy that looks like he fucking lives in Austin, Texas shit with his hat and his highlights. You know, I love a little bit of metrosexual spice in there. Um, so with his little highlights and his little boots, I was like, hmm, okay. What are you, a private investigator? Hmm. Me too, in a sense. <laughs> um, what am I talking about? Okay, so Harvey looks like shit the first day. Um, I mean, he looked horrible the whole time. He's a dying 70-year-old man. Uh, he looks like shit. He's literally been living in prison and is a convicted rapist. Of course he looks like hell. But compared to i even saw a video which this is crazy i know i'm jumping all over but so house and habit she if you guys don't know she covers trials everything she's a journalist but like gonzo journalism like hunter s thompson where like you become the story also love what she's doing so she got an uber driver and it was this woman cat and this woman is apparently like a independent paparazzi so it's like jess house and habit is really good at like pulling things in the universe like these crazy connections in the universe so she gets in an uber to go to the trial in the morning and this woman cat her driver is a like private in independent paparazzi person who has her own YouTube page. I forget, it's Kat. I'm gonna link it below. And she literally has video of Harvey. Meanwhile, hold on, she has video of Epstein getting put, his body getting put in the fucking ambulance when he's dead from the thing. She has that on her YouTube page. And then she also, in like the same video, she's like filming and then she like sees Harvey Weinstein like in the cuffs walking. Crazy coincidence. I don't even know how that's possible that that ended up being her driver who then Kat ended up going to the courthouse every day. Cause also then the Megan Thee Stallion case started happening simultaneously. So we had the case with Scientology with Danny Masterson hide from that 70s show. So there was like this crazy Scientology influence going on. Then the Megan the Stallion, Tory Lanez case happens and then that was crazy. Oh my God, Tory Lanez's son is so sweet. Um, But so, oh my God, everything. So then, yeah, this woman cat has this video of Harvey getting in the New York trial, being put in like cuffs and transported. And he looks so scary in that, um, in that video. When I like, she's like filming on her phone and then like it kind of like gets to like by Harvey's face, like straight on to him. And I was watching it and I was like, oh, I was like, damn, it's hard to believe that that's the same person, even from the New York trial, um, just from 2020, only two years, that it's the same person because he is so, I don't know, not well. Um, what's funny though, so I also, these other crazy, awesome characters that I met, I don't even know, I, there's so much to get into. But the sketch artists, I am obsessed with the sketch artists. I love them. So one of them is Mona. So you probably actually have seen her stuff all over. 
like literally she has done like every trial. And so also the other sketch artist is Bill O'Reilly. No, not Bill O'Reilly. What am I saying? Bill Robles. Oh my God. So Bill, he's great. I don't know how old he is. I feel like it would be rude to um, guess. But um, I asked him like, what are some of your favorite trials that you worked on? So he did work on the OJ trial. He literally was on that same floor in 1993 or four, whatever it was. And he was literally sketching in that trial too. So like, that's amazing, incredible, a couple doors down. Um, he actually did sketches. They had several sketch artists for that trial and he did the jury. And then he got subpoenaed by the judge, by judge, what was his name? Ito? From the, um, from the OJ trial, subpoenaed this sketch artist and basically told him that he has to change the hairstyles of these jurors because these are distinguishing features that some of them had very um distinguishing hairstyles and features and that they were too uh noticeable so that's crazy um i asked him too like uh i was like okay so like what was like your favorite trial you ever worked on and he said uh well his favorite was michael jackson because he made the most money ever doing that. Like he made, imagine licensing those photos that probably still pays the bills, you know, from the trials with, um, I forget, I think it was, I think it was the um, accusations because it was, they're the actual, I have his business card, it has, um, the picture of Michael Jackson on it. Um, also, I was like, who else? Like, who is like the scariest? He was like, honestly, um, I asked him also too, because Ghislaine Maxwell, when she had done her trial, she was staring down the sketch artist and drawing them too. And he's like, oh, they all do stuff like that. And he's like, uh, that Charles Manson, he also did one of the Charles Manson things. I doubt the original. He's not, I don't think he's that old. Um, I think he probably did one of these probation hearings, um, something like that. But he did that and he said um, that he stares you down and does that type of stuff too. But eh, it's not too scary. Uh, he said he also did the Unabomber. Like literally imagine I am obsessed with these people. Just my whole experience, I didn't know that I was going to cover a trial in that way, ever in my life. Um, the way that it ended up happening, and I did kind of share it a little bit, but this is the more in-depth story. So basically, the way that it ended up happening was my friend Yoshi. Yoshi's amazing. I could talk forever about all the stuff that Yoshi does and did, and what an interesting person. So one of the things that he does is he goes to these trials. He went to the Glane trial and he was there the day that they said guilty. Like he literally saw so much, like so many key moments of the Glane trial. He like has a good sense of like which day to go. So whatever, we were talking and he's like, you know, the Harvey trial's coming up, you should go. And he told me, you know, at times to go to the Glane sentencing too, but to fly to New York and all that, I just didn't have the finances at the time to do it. But Harvey being here in LA, he's like, oh, you should go to the trial. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I, yeah, maybe I will. That seems like something exciting or interesting to do. Um, I didn't think about like covering it really. I just thought like kind of like, okay, that's like something that I think I would like, I don't know, enjoy or have fun doing or something. Uh, and it's just like a weird experience. And like, I don't know why at the time, I didn't know why. Now already with just a couple months time from the trial, um, I do understand why I do because I needed to, this whole thing of the film industry, 
the sexual exchange, the gray area, the things that are rapey, but maybe not fully rape. All of these things are like, have been huge themes of my life living in LA. Like literally the first movie even that I worked on here in LA, because I had worked on some movies in New York in production. Um, so then when I had worked here, the first set that I had worked on, and in this one, I was the first AD of independent feature. And on my like literal first day there, the we're driving in, not even on set yet, and the wardrobe designer is like, oh, um, you know, Sundance is coming up. We should go, it would be fun. I'm like, you could just go to Sundance, like if you want to, you don't have to like be invited. And she's like, well, you, there's so many parties and all this stuff. So you just go to go to the parties and to meet people and to network. And I'm like, oh, so like you just go and like what hang out at the bars and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm like, well, that sounds cool. Maybe we should do that. And this was, mind you, 2012. And I don't know, I was probably what, 25, 24, 23, actually. And so, yeah, then she's like, yeah, but if you go to Sundance, watch out for Harvey Weinstein because he likes girls like you. And I'm like, what? Like, she's like, I don't know. He's just, he likes young girls that look like you. So if you go, just be careful. I'm like, okay. I didn't go, but I always remembered this. That was actually the first time I'd ever really heard the name Harvey Weinstein. And then I kind of started putting it together after that of like, oh, okay. This is like this big, like producer that produced all of these movies that I love. Um, that's why this name, I've seen this name and stuff, but like to add it together, that was like really that I had ever heard about him. What's crazy is that like in this trial, that's literally how almost all of these girls, except for one, three of the four Jane Doe's plus of the other girls still like two of the other girls out of the four. Um, so majority of everyone in this trial this is exactly how they got into that situation with harvey was that they were at a film festival doing the film festival networky thing and it led to um you know the now not everything was like full rape um so that's the thing that also made this trial very complicated. And when you're watching it, it's so crazy because you're watching it through the eyes of the law. And I've never really looked at things in this way before because for me, I look at things usually in a moral way. With this trial, I have noticed that like, when you're in that room, it's almost like, sorry, this kombucha is making me burp. Um, when you're in the room, it's almost like, well, these are the rules of the game. And you really get pulled out of your perspective as a human. So now that like the trial's done, I'm pulled back from it and I'm like, whoa, that was so weird. Like that's not even how the world is, but that is how the world works. Cause this is a system of power and control. And this is the system that says whether people are free, innocent, guilty, all this stuff. So this is an important system, but when you're so immersed in it, and especially I saw pretty much as good as it gets because you get these incredible lawyers, Harvey's lawyers were incredible. You get these prosecutors who, I mean, they didn't come off great, but they're up against people who have been doing, they did their jobs their whole career and then became defense attorneys, had a whole nother second career. So of course they're not gonna be as good. Um, but in a normal situation that you're not up against the best of the best, they are really probably incredible, crazy good um, prosecutors that do incredible work, which is probably why they were on this trial anyway. And in the end, Harvey's probably gonna get, the, the sentencing is coming up um, in a couple weeks, I am gonna go. Um, and Harvey's probably gonna get like 18 years for 
the Jane Doe one for the three counts that he did um, against her. So they scored, they killed it. They did their job, they crushed it, they got the time, they did all that. So really it's only us that was in the room that saw it, that was like, saw the performance was not great because when it's written down in history is that they won. You know, and they got the bad guy to do time. Okay, so I got distracted there. Um, but just talking about everything. And also, one more thing before I get into some of the spiritual stuff um, connected to the trial. Uh, just because, you know, this is my audience. And this is, I know, the stuff that you guys connect with. So maybe normally I wouldn't have shared some of these things. If it was just the normal coverage. Which is why I didn't put them on TikTok. Um, but... On that note, the last year on TikTok, it's now coming up on my like year anniversary of like posting on social media in that way and having my TikTok blow up and all this stuff and my life changing. And me really stepping into my full power of who I am. And so everything was like so buzzing high. You know, we have the Apocalypse series, the Earth Shift series, boom, 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 boom. All these series, like the Soul series, the Dimension series was like, cracked my brain open. And those Dimension series, series like really wiped me out because it was like each one was like 10 minutes of like pure, like, oh my God, like this shit's getting downloaded from somewhere in the universe into me and coming out, I'm exhausted. I don't even know, like, reality is not reality like the dimension series got so crazy and like because it was it described so in a way that I never even thought I could describe and each one of those took so much out of me but I was like whoa I'm fucking cosmic and then this Harvey trial pops up where my friend Yoshi is like I can't go because he does medical testing, which this is so funny. He does um, trials for medications and I think he was testing a liver medication. And this is such a funny little fact. Um, the reason that he does a lot of this testing is because he's Japanese and actually a lot of medication used to not be really tested on Japanese people because a lot of them were getting tested here. And that had side effects. There was different side effects that never um, that later led to these different lawsuits and stuff because they weren't testing on Japanese people, but then they're using that medication in the Japanese market. So they actually pay a pretty little penny to Japanese people, especially Japanese men, because, you know, obviously a lot of the medical testing is on men. And so he was locked up in this facility for 36 days. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me telling this story. Back in the day, he told this story, like stories about his medical testing on the podcast. So I, I should have asked first, but um, he's locked up in this facility doing this testing. Um, so every day I would call him after the trial, uh, which was great. And yeah, I'm so glad that Yoshi pushed me to do it because he's like, just go, Jen. It'll be fun. It'll be fine. Go, just go in. You're a member of the public. It's your tax dollars that pay for these trials. Go on in. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And then that first day I went in, I was like, I walked out and was like, I'm a journalist. Oh my God, I'm a journalist. I'm in my new life. I'm in a new timeline. And that's like kind of like when before I went in that morning and it was so early and I didn't sleep because I'm not used to, I, you know, I do these videos late at night when I do these YouTubes and stuff too. So, you know, I'm a late night gal. So when I have to wake up and be somewhere by 5 a.m., meaning that I have to leave my house before 5 a.m., um, I didn't sleep. I slept like one or two hours that first night. My heart was racing that first night that I went before I went. I was so scared and like I don't usually get scared I I have like maybe I'm not even like able to acknowledge some fear but like fear that I was like that was like nerves like bubbling um and I was like why am I so nervous and I like thought to myself I'm like well what about psychic attacks what about the Illuminati psychic attacking me 
What about um the dangerous stuff that could happen? <laughs> so then I was like, okay, this is impractical. Come back down. You're gonna fucking go. You're gonna fucking see Harvey Weinstein's fucking ugly face. You're gonna go. And that's what I did. And I went and I walked out after that first day and was like, I have a new life. I am in a new timeline. I am capable of so many things that I never thought of. I have a mission to tell this story. Like I was so fucking inspired. Um, but okay, so back to the bailiff. So this like awesome female bailiff, um, she held it down and everyone like talked shit on her, all the reporters, because they're like, God, she's so mean. And it's like, yeah, you'd be mean too if you're literally a sheriff and you feel like you're babysitting adults. There's three rules or four rules of the courtroom. Not every courtroom. This courtroom specifically. You are not allowed to have your phones. You are not allowed to have your laptops or anything like that. Um, you're not allowed to chew gum. Simple. Not allowed to um, write notes to each other. You're not allowed to talk or make like reactions. Very simple things to do um, when this is a life-changing situation for people. For the Jane Doe's, for Harvey, for the lawyers, the jury has taken their time. This is not a TV show. As much as it fucking felt like one, like I felt like I was in the greatest TV show ever. Like I have to probably write the TV show of it because it was, I can't believe I lived that. I can't believe I lived that every day that I went there at like, I went 6 a.m. in the beginning. After that, I started going at like eight mostly. I was always there very early, but like for literally two months, this was the first day I went was October 14th. We got the verdict right before Christmas. I think it was like December 20th we got it. So literally two full months of this like seeing Harvey every day and you know that's the weird part too is that like you see him all the time you like I don't know you add things to the story also okay getting back to that first day so when I got in and I was one of the only people in the room what was so crazy is like you know they wheeled out Harvey and he that was the only time that anyone really got to see him in his um prison uniform and so he was there sitting like alone um you know his lawyers were kind of like doing things and stuff so Harvey was there sitting like facing this direction I'm sitting here facing that there's a court reporter there the judge is sitting right is sitting right there and then the bailiff is behind him on the other side and we were all like staring at him and there was like this moment of silence and I swear this was like what I saw like happen in my head. Again, you know, I'm very visual. I always, there's, like I said, there's always a mu music video or something going on in my head to the world around us. So this is not abnormal to see this. Um, but this was so funny. Was like, I kind of like saw that we were like, there was like five of us like in a circle around him and he was in the center and all five of us were women. And this was a women-led court. This was women bailiff. The women, um, mostly court reporters are, but this was a f female um, judge. Every woman there was a woman. Even actually there was two other people that were kind of in and out that did occasionally, which was the clerk, she was female. And then also the pool reporter that day was a female too. So it was literally just like all women except for the lawyers. And I just felt like, <sighs> like this like like he was inside of our pentagram of like I don't know and it was before the trial started and it was so like weirdly intimate because he wasn't like dressed in his suit and everything and it was also all of the stuff that wasn't going to be in the trial it was like all the behind the scenes shit where they talked about Rose McGowan they talked about crazy stuff um, in the pre-trial, like going back and reading my notes, I was like, what the fuck? I wrote down everything I heard that I actually didn't hear it. I only like wrote it down. 
maybe I, I do kind of want to go through my notes in another video because the notes are insane. The crazy details that I didn't get to put in all of those um, videos. But if that's something you guys want, because this is just, I know, we're all ready to be over Harvey by now. But I felt like he was like in the middle of our pentagram and we were like, you will not hurt another woman. You are in this circle and we are putting you in here. You are going to spend this time inside of this circle until a jury of people decide your fate, sir. And I don't know, like I felt like some weird cosmic shit and I know it was so dramatic, but I felt that because we were all like staring at him and he was in the center of us and it was just like these five women, like five powerful women were like, boom, like, how dare you? You will answer for your crimes. And um, then I went home and I was like, did he manifest that? Cause he's a fucking pervert. <laughs> fucking pervert was surrounded by five women today. Did he fucking manifest that? Is he jerking off to that right now? That sick fuck? <laughs> like, there was like times like when you're in that courtroom, you feel almost in a mesmerized hypnotic state. Then you come home. First of all, you're drained, exhausted. Those lights, those everything. It is the energy, the fact that you can't really react to anything. The fact that like you have to be silent. You know, you're writing notes feverishly. I just... When you're in there, it's very dull. When you come out, you're like, <gasps> that was literally one of the most intense things I ever experienced in my life. But when you're in there, it's like this. Like. That's what you're doing but then you come out and you're like oh my fucking god like I literally heard all these stories that are so parallel to my life I'm gonna be fine <laughs> okay that's one thing to talk about too I will get into this like spiritual weird things but this is another thing that is I guess for me for my journey too because if you guys have listened to my other videos about um basically my past lives and even in this life too and i am gonna have more that i'm gonna be sharing about that but i've had these issues time and time again with men in general um specifically i mean love relationship sex all of it it's a problem uh <laughs> so yeah i have been in a lot of situations that like what we were hearing on trial and these things happened like 2004 2005 2007 2013 what's crazy is you know the world was a different place before the me too movement and this was a big thing that kept coming up in the trial which it is true that it is a different place because there's a lot of things that were acceptable then that are not acceptable now but we didn't even know that they weren't acceptable so like how could we stop them so i think you know, when I'm in the courtroom and I'm looking at it like these are the rules of the game. Oh, that's out of bounds. That's this. That's that. Then when you actually pull back from it, you're like, holy crap. I've been in too many situations like this, too, where a lot of these situations are like, say, for example, not like full blown regular rape, obviously. A lot of them are like these weird nuance situations that are like you're expressing that you don't want to, but your reasons aren't working. You're like, oh, I have a boyfriend. Oh, I this. Oh, I'm on my period. Oh, I'm this. And when it's like still like all of your answers don't work and they're still pushing themselves on you. And then um, a lot of times now, not as much, but, you know, my growing up era, you know, I'm not that old, but the world was very different. And there was also a lot of older men that were very predatory. So it wasn't like the sexual upbringing that a lot of people in my age group, you know, a lot of millennials, especially the older millennials, um, a lot of us, even though we're only like one generation older than this younger generation, 
the people who were coming after us at such a young age and it was still in the time where it was like still this very lolita culture where it's like 15 16 17 is like still kind of like yeah it's barely legal it's this it's that you know it wasn't like it is now where it's like you get called a pedophile before it was like normal behavior to go after a teenage girl if you were like in your 20s late 20s or 30s early 30s like now we live in a different world so a lot of people in my age group um which i was a lot younger than a lot of the jane does um the jane does are all mostly at least 10 years older i would say than me um because a lot of them are around my age now um when some of this stuff happened so it just was a lot because like hearing these people like talk about these sexual experiences and I'm not really able to react, but then also I've like lived very similar experiences and a lot of it. And I know that this goes for a lot of people too, is like, you don't really realize that that's what it is. So you keep talking to the person or maybe you do realize what it is and you keep talking to the person anyway. And this is just some fucked up coping mechanism, but then that becomes a huge thing in the court, which for me, watching it, I'm like, well, this is the rules of the game. Why did they go back and hang out with Harvey again? Why did they hang out with Harvey three more times? Why did they, uh, you know, watch Harvey jerk off and agree to do that in exchange for a meeting? You know, you get very cynical of those things. But with time to, like, pull back of, like, being in the game, these are the rules of the game. You're like, oh God, you know, this is literally what my book is about, which by the way, guys, um, my book, I know I've like hinted a little bit at a memoir. It's a mix of a memoir and like comedic self-help slash social commentary. Um, I've hinted at this book a couple times in like different videos. Um, it's really, it's moving forward. As you know, I've been writing this book for 10 years and I realize now I've had to write some of those things. Cause like, say for example, this parallel experience that I've had, um, with a lot of the stuff that I heard on the trial, I've had this several times. But when I was 16, when I lost my virginity, was the worst one. Um, for sure, you know, so you set the bar really high or low. I don't know what it is, but, you know, it makes other things that are unacceptable um, more acceptable over time. But what was crazy too is like kind of like hearing these experiences it mine happened like pretty much like the same year as some of the experiences that these things people were talking about they were talking about why did you keep hanging out with the person same thing that i did i actually wrote in my memoir which i needed to write it years ago because from a place of being healed now i just don't have the same emotions towards it but i needed to write it in a place of being emotional in order for it to be good for the book so now I can see why it's taken 10 years for this to fully come together. And there's also an audience for it now, you know, people who do resonate with the information that I share, but then also I think a lot of people resonate with my life story. I feel many women, most women in my age group, a little bit older, a little bit younger, all had a very similar experience, um, experiences as a woman. And one of these being this like kind of blurry area and then to keep talking to the person and then what's even crazier is that you know I have looked up this person um as an adult you know I've looked up who this older person was that uh I lost my virginity to you know in a fucked up kind of situation uh and that person is also defense attorney so it was like everything was so like parallel even like the one woman she made a promise to her daughter to come forward because she wanted her daughter to come forward because of something that happened at school the school that the daughter went to was right like next to my job when i when i uh, managed the weed shops so i used to like be the weed person the i wouldn't say dealer because it was a legal store well somewhat legal store um I was the one that was selling all the weed basically to the to the neighborhood and there happens to be 18 year old kids that also were legally allowed to buy it in that neighborhood that went to that high school 
So that's what's crazy too, is that like all of these things, like the, a lot of these things, these hotels that they happened at that year that they were in the hotel, I was in the same place, um, the same restaurants. Like even one of the things that the attorneys was like, well, she could have been at this restaurant and it was literally the restaurant that I used to work at for years. Everything was so with this case, like one degree of separation from so many things. Like even I had a mentor who had told me he's a guy um, who's no longer my mentor, but um, he had told me some stories about Harvey Weinstein that he experienced, which is crazy because that stuff is way worse than anything I heard on the trial. You know, Ooh, why isn't he going to jail for that? But I don't know, probably a lot of uh, international things that are beyond the jurisdictions of these laws. Um, but it was just crazy for me. And I feel like on like a spiritual level, on an energetic level, I needed to see this whole trial play out you know I needed to see all of this play out and it's like I would never go to trial for anything that has happened with me in my life there's even people that you know I still do know that there's things like that were questionable and it's like that's the other thing too I felt a little incepted by it too because it actually I realized one of these things is that how much the story changes when the story teller image of themselves changes. So like, say for example, we have transcripts in court of the previous people's, um, we have transcripts of the previous people's, um, sorry, we have transcripts in court of the Jane Doe's, what they had originally told police. Now we have them telling their story in court. Not one person told the same story so that's what also makes it like, that's what makes it me understand how stuff like this happens. I felt like before that like, oh, rich and powerful people just get away with everything because they have money. And yes, that was partly true because he could afford the good lawyers, but he didn't get away with it. But at the same time, um, I don't know, it's just all of these things are so complicated and you understand why things go the way they do in a court case because like say for example the governor's wife um Gavin Newsom's wife that was a whole nother thing when she was on the stand she literally was talking about how he physically picked her up and grabbed her and carried her to the room but in her original testimony to the police she said she was just like he grabbed her arm and kind of guided her there and that's a big difference in someone's credibility in their story. And what I noticed as an observer and also as going through my own healing of a similar situation, which I have done so much work on that healing. So I feel like I've, you know, I'm over, I wouldn't, you wouldn't want to say that you're completely over everything because once you really do feel like you're completely healed from something is usually when you get like a kick in your ass that you're not. So I wouldn't go that far to say I'm a hundred percent healed from like all of these things, but um, my idea of what these things are is very different now than when they happened to then when I got into like a victim mentality and I understood what happened and then moving on and healing and learning to really forgive and forgive for yourself, you know? So one of the things that's crazy is that I saw that like, when these people first gave their testimony to police, maybe they weren't as much seeing themselves as a victim. But then when they're on the stand, they feel so much like a victim that the story becomes more of a victim's story where like the governor's wife was the worst. She was really like telling a story. And what's crazy is I completely understand her situation where in the end she gave Harvey a hand job and was moaning during it to make him finish faster. Now everyone's like, well, how could it be a non consensual experience? I understand that logic on the base level as a woman who's actually lived in not only LA was evil demonic town, but also lived in New York <laughs> another. And also, you know, I'm from, you know, 
uh, Jersey City. So basically, I had so many problems before I even left Jersey City of different fucked up things with people. So I do realize why you would give someone a hand job to make something get over faster, um, which is such a crazy fucked up thing to have to even say in court. So I am very sympathetic of her situation. Of her as a person, she's insufferable. I'm sorry. Um, but her testimony, you know, it was the jury could not come to a decision because it was eight people believed her and four people didn't believe her. So that's, I do believe what the split was going to be. But, okay, let's talk about one last thing about the governor's wife. You know, after I posted that nasty video about her that went viral, um, I know I'm high on the governor's shit list. And, and I did post a video about this, but I took it down. Maybe one day I'll post all it again here. Uh, I got, after that video about the governor's wife, like the next day, wake up and my fucking phone got completely zapped. It turned to the apple and it just stayed the apple and that was it for eight hours. And then I tried at at and store. They said they can't. Apple store, they couldn't. They just had to wipe the entire phone. And then my phone reset to the last day I had backed it up, which was the first day of the trial, which was October 24th of the actual trial, not the pre-trial, like I said earlier. So everything got like just reset to that day. Crazy. Um, do I think the governor did it? I don't know. I asked the person at the Apple store. They said probably not. I don't know. Anyway. Okay, so one of the things in this trial that was really interesting is there was only like one recording. And the recording was damaging to Harvey because the recording basically says, um, he's really pressuring this girl to go into the hotel room and she's saying she doesn't want to, she's not comfortable, she's scared, she wants to go downstairs. So what was important is hearing her say no in a hundred different ways and him not taking no for an answer. And that recording is very scary and it does make you feel like, oh, like, because there's so many like, oh, they wanted it, oh, they wanted it for their careers. And there's always gonna be that element to it. Um, and of course, there's a lot of people who now they weren't in their victim story that they're in now. At that time, they were in that, I'm a star, I'm an actor, I'm a succeeder, I'm a, you know, I'm the famous person, I'm rich. You know, that's who they wanted to be. So when that inappropriate scenario happened, they, the story was different in the moment because the story is like, I'm a star, I just made the greatest connection of my life with one of the greatest producers to ever live. So the story is different. So that's something that I noticed not only about myself, and that's why I felt a little incepted by the trial because hearing a lot of those victim stories made me feel a little different about some situations that had happened. That I'm like, okay, look. My, and then I talked about it with my friend. She put it so well. She's like, look, you don't need to be stoked about something. But at the same time, if you're not like, perceiving a situation that is in this way that's harmful and it's like okay yes you know the situation wasn't great but at the same time you're like fine and can forgive the fact that the person I don't know I think maybe that's something that I'll talk about at the end is kind of the other side of it because I definitely do think I've seen the other side of Harvey's story too from a lot of the experiences in my life because I've known a lot of sex addicts so okay in this one recording that was of Harvey asking a girl to go into the hotel room, he says this weird thing and I heard it on the first day of the trial and I wrote it down and highlighted it, came up again, came up again. It was never answered and I still wonder. So he's like telling her to come into the room and there's like, she's like, no, I wanna go downstairs. And he's like, no, you can't go down there. The witches have a whole thing down there. It's real scary. I was like, he said the witches have a whole thing thing down there it's real scary I'm like that has to be wrong weeks later it gets played again and I'm like it's the witches are down no one's gonna ask about the witches they fucking are gonna ask different people about this they're not gonna ask about who the witches are down there I'm just never gonna know who the witches down there are what does that mean 
So I never found out. Okay. Now, one of the other things that, now this was one of the most spiritual experiences during the trial for me. And so Jane Doe won when she was telling her story. She's the one who he'll probably get 18 years of prison time for. Now, when she was telling her story, she was married at the time that this happened. And she did say at one point that her husband is now deceased. And when she said that, oh my God, I literally like had to hold back to I was like literally like, <gasps> like, oh my God. Because it wasn't even that her husband wasn't alive. It was that, I don't know, for like, this was right in the beginning. That was the first week of the trial was so intense. I, that first week of the trial was so intense for everyone. Even when we interviewed the jurors after the trial, what, that's what one of them said. And I am going to talk about him in a second because this, he relates to this. But he said that that first week of the trial was so intense. And it was. That was very intense that first week. Like, oh my God. Um, some of the other stuff became more Hollywood and name droppy and like everyone was like, oh, a star and ooh, star power and oh my God, celebrity. It became so, it was different. But Jane Doe won, which is why I know that she got the conviction on him, on those charges, because not only was she very believable, her story was very intense and she was real, you know? But during the time that she was in the trial, in the room, on the stand, I literally felt like there was like this like presence in the room, like, like angels, like even Harvey's, like it even felt like, like, I don't know, like you would be silent for so long and like being silent and still for so long, even though there's like stuff that you're watching, I feel like, especially too, with like me being, you know, a meditator and all of that stuff, I felt like, wow, I feel like Harvey's angels are here watching. Not that they're like supportive of what he's done, but they're watching this like judgment moment and it felt interesting. Like there's some family members or something and I don't know, I'm not a medium or anything, but that's like, it felt very strong. And I felt it very strong in this side of the room too that I was sitting on, which was like where the Jane Doe was and where the jurors were. And it just felt like this really like strong presence of like people are here watching, like souls are here watching this. And I know that's happening all the time, but I think maybe it felt like this strong presence because they were there maybe also in support or in, you know, being with them. And then when she said that her husband was no longer alive, I literally was like, <gasps> because it was like, oh my God, that's what I feel in this room. Not only him, but the fact that he's here watching her on the stand here and like supporting her. And it was just, wow, I just got this feeling of like, wow, the loved ones are here watching. Then what's crazy is after the trial, when we got to interview some of the jurors, the two interviews that I got to be a part of were with the two male jurors who the whole time I kind of, everyone was projecting onto them and I projected as well. And cause they kind of like had these kind of macho vibes. They seemed a little like they were more chauvinistic seeming. They always kind of went off to their, two of them went off to themselves and the rest of them like kind of hung out with the girls. And like, they would be the first out the room. They were kind of like, everyone's like, oh, those guys are the hold up. They're the ones, they're the ones who don't believe the girls. They're the ones. I didn't believe that they were the ones that didn't believe the girls, but I believed that they were like machismo. Like, yeah, these are the guys. Cause also they would watch like the attorneys, the male attorneys that were representing Harvey. And they'd be like, hmm how a man talks like mm, nice strong man manhood you know so he would look at Alan Jackson which I mean Alan Jackson is an incredible lawyer we all looked at Alan Jackson like man look at that man look at that tailoring look at that he's good that's a legit lawyer so he looked at him like any of us did but a lot of the jurors were more neutral but a lot of times I'd saw him like kind of like have this like 
admiration and I'm like oh man he doesn't he's gonna side with Harvey because of this and I am glad that the two people that I got to be a part of the interviews with were those two jurors because it was very enlightening because the one of them who kind of I saw like like he was admiring the lawyers he actually shared that his daughter had passed away and that she was an attorney and then when he said that I understood again like that feeling that I felt that first week this like heavy feeling that like people are here in this room souls are here this room is packed with more people than is here physically and when he said that I was like oh that's what it when he was looking at the lawyer he wasn't looking because like he's like oh like that's a man that's how a man is even though you know alan jackson was giving this very macho masculine vibe i was like damn he was thinking about his daughter he was thinking about like wow i'm proud of what my daughter did proud of my daughter's career and now i get to see firsthand this two-month trial of like kind of what my daughter could have done and it was like this like watching over and I now I realized too like this like feeling of like it felt like people were there now what's crazy is that feeling is even more intense in the hallway that ninth floor hallway where all of these things have gone down and literally waited there I think I waited for 11 days Ugh. 11 days of jury deliberation sitting in that fucking uncomfortable hallway oh. um that hallway is a portal like straight up i tried to talk about it with some of the people from the mainstream media but uh they were not as you know i'm like damn man this shit's like a portal they're like mm, what do you mean i'm like this like thing it's like literally like a crossroads of souls and it like sucks people here they're like what the fuck are you talking about i'm like you don't feel this hallway is clearly an important por portal for souls okay sure but one of the things too and now okay so that we could talk a little bit about you know i made some great friends um one like I said house and habit um she's so cool I love her also Brie who's jaggy ish um if you guys followed my coverage you also saw that I had linked some of her stuff and she does also independent journalism so it was like us three independent journalists um it was just cool having this little trio and what was very interesting about it is okay so I am a Scorpio rising and a Leo sun. House and habit, I believe, is Scorpio sun, Leo moon, I think. And Jaggy-ish is Leo rising, Scorpio moon. So we all have this Leo Scorpio thing going on in our top three. So how interesting is it that the three of us all ended up at this trial, this combination of Leo Scorpio, the Scorpio who wants to dig and get all the answers, but the Leo who's gonna be like, and I don't care what it takes, I'm gonna get in that room and I'm gonna watch it myself and I'm gonna get there first and I'm gonna push in the line, you know? So it's like, I feel like it's the Scorpio side that digs for the information, but it's the Leo side that's like, and I'm gonna go there myself and walk in like I belong there. So I just thought that was so funny and interesting that um, we all, the three independent people, all have this Leo Scorpio combination. That's apparently what makes people want to, for two months, go to a rape trial of a famous um, people, many famous people. Um, okay. So also, oh yeah, just about it being a portal. Um, the portal that is that hallway is so crazy because you have people that are doing 
life-changing trials, life-changing decisions. Um, they are losing their children. They are getting their children. They are taking their rights. They are getting their rights. They are free. They are not free. They have all of these things, this deception. So like those are the people on trial. Then all the jurors and people that are brought there. Then all like the families and the people that are connected to these cases, the victims' families, the you know prosecutor, the perpetrators' families also the attorneys, also these judges, also different people, these independent people like me. All of these different people get pulled to this place. And it's just interesting. It's like everyone is looking for something. And, you know, one of the things that was very interesting, and I talked about this a lot with Brie throughout the trial, is that I'm like, damn, like this portal, like it pulled everyone here. And... She's like, well, like, what do you think everyone was looking for? And it's just interesting when we start to think about like all of us journalists. Well, I'm not a journalist, but with all the journalists um, in the hallway, you know, up to like 20 of us or so. And a lot of us, it was like summer camp because for two months you were there every day with the same people and, you know, getting to know each other under the conversation of like these crazy rape stories and stuff you know and it's like underlying that you're like developing these relationships and friendships and you know Brie was like well, what do you think everyone was like looking for what was everyone pulled to the portal for what was everyone pulled there for and then we started to think about it and it's like wow like there was like one woman who kind of was like sick and then like she came back to journaling to being a journalist and it was almost like she needed people to know that she was sick and that she's back now. And then like another person who I really loved, he was such a great guy. Um, just a really good person. He had a daughter and I feel like this trial was like confirmation to him of like, you're doing the right thing. You're being a good dad, you know, you're defending and protecting your daughter and women. You're doing the right thing. I feel like for some people they were looking for like, excitement like literally they have this job that is filled with excitement but they don't see it as exciting anymore and it's like they needed people like me and the other independent people to come in and kind of bring excitement back into it what did I need now what was interesting I didn't know what I need sorry I didn't know what I need um, cause I just had kind of done this because my friend was, you know, trapped in a liver medication trial and really wanted to go, but then couldn't. So then he convinced me to go. And then I was changed the moment that I did it. I didn't realize that one of the things that I needed was kind of, um, and this is important because this is about, you know, spirituality to pull, I was very much in like my 5d world, you know, I don't know what you want to call it my spiritual world. And I needed to kind of be pulled back down to my 3D world and be really in the 3D world, in the body, in this, you know, living this life, which it was important. It was important for me to be like shifting. So it's like, I just want to like remind everyone when you're on your spiritual journey, there is so many mountains. I've been on my spiritual journey for 10 years you know, deep into my spiritual journey for 10 years. Obviously there was glimpses and stuff before, but there's times where you literally like, it's all that you think about, all that you read about, all that you talk about, all that you live about. And then there's times where you're in a different chapter and your life gets focused back on the 3D world. And this time that I came to the 3D world again and like focused, is life-changing it changed me as a person it like my capabilities like you know how fucking confident I mean I'm a Leo I am confident already but you know how confident it makes you to be like I was scared to go to that trial then the next day I was like oh fuck this I'm gonna be here every day first and I'm gonna cover this and I'm gonna tell TikTok exactly like it is and there's not like someone doing this and I want to see this so I'm gonna do it myself and actually do it and follow through and actually did it. And it's like, fuck, that is what I needed. That is what I needed, um, that I didn't know I needed. And I also didn't know that I needed such a good 3D moment. Like it don't get more 3D than sitting in a rape trial for two months. Like 
my spiritual takeaways are minor. You know, that's how 3D it is. Um, well, I think with that, I want to say about the other thing that I learned that was very important, that was my biggest takeaway from this whole thing that, I mean, this changed me, but everything changes me. I feel like I go and I, like say for this trial, I went, I went a hundred percent. I went full in. I did a hundred percent what you do. I lived it fully in the moment. And I feel like because I do do those things and live like that is part of the reason why it's, um, it feels like I've lived a hundred lives because I live it fully when I'm in it. And I literally felt like I lived a whole life as a fucking journalist and I'm good on that, you know? So that's one of the things that I learned is I met all of these incredible people that were, like I said, from LA times, um, you know, where I was featured in one of the articles. Um, but then also a bunch of other outlets, you know, prestigious outlets and also some media outlets that I absolutely fucking hate. Like what's crazy about this, which was one of the biggest things that I probably had to learn from this, even though I learned so much. Um, one of the things that I had to learn the most was there's one media outlet that I hate that like, that's my go-to when I'm talking shit about the media. The one word that I would say, the one outlet that I'd say like, that's my go-to. That's the one that gets under my skin. The woman who works for that outlet is my favorite. Like I just loved her. I loved her so much. And every day she was just a great, a bundle of joy, a great person, great to be around. Loved everything about her. Uh, I miss her. So that was really important to me for like me to understand that like these, even these media outlets that I get so angry at sometimes for the way they tell their stories. I'm like, damn, but these like these people behind it are really just like amazing people that I really love that are great people that I'm so glad that I met. Um, even if it doesn't amount to anything, you know, our friendship, the time that we spent together was special. And that also along those lines, I also believe that the media was always fucking lying. Um, because every time that I've been involved in a situation that then was in the media, um, not like me being reported as one of the people. Um, but there's a lot of things that I've been there and I've seen and know what happened and then it gets reported because like I said, I've worked in Beverly Hills and LA for over 10 years. You know, when shit goes down, you hear shit. And sometimes shit happens while you're working somewhere, you know, like the time Suge Knight punched my boss in the face. Like, yeah, that ended up on TMZ. The story behind it is completely false. So like every time that I've ever seen anything and then it's reported on, it's a completely false story which is the reason I don't like the mainstream media. One of the many reasons. And I thought I was impressed that everyone was reporting very similar stuff and everyone was reporting because that's what was happening. So they were reporting it accurately. So I was really proud to see that, that I was like, you know what? Not only did this trial make me realize that these media outlets are filled with great people, um, that they are also telling the story the way it is sometimes. Um, especially it's not like politically charged or anything. I'm like, okay, so that makes me really happy. Um, also, uh, the main takeaway is like, these people all have very prestigious jobs in writing. Like who doesn't want to do, you know, be a columnist for the New York Times, right? If you're a writer. And me as a writer, um, I had kind of at times in my life aspired to want those things. Not really like super actively, you know, but it is something that has come up throughout times in my life where I'm like, well, that seems like a good job to have. That seems like something I could do. No, I can't because my opinions, whenever I have submitted for these things, they don't want my opinion there. Even though my opinion usually is proven to be true shortly after, but you know how it is as a conspiracy theorist. Um, but no, my articles, never got picked up by those bigger um, places. And I felt like even going into this that like, oh wow, this could lead to an opportunity for me for working to working for like some like huge um, thing. Cause I need money. Somebody's gotta pay the light bill. It's me. So make sure you share this. Um, but 
at the same time, I saw when it came down to specifically, say, the governor's wife, because the stuff that was happening day to day was easy to report on. Then when it came to the governor's wife, where she was clearly telling a story and acting and doing stuff on that stand um, and acting in a way that was just, it was very off-putting. So the three independent people, me, House and Habit, and Jackie-ish, we told our fucking story the way that we saw it, what she said, how she acted. And obviously those things blew up because it became politically charged. And I knew that when I posted that video about Gavin Newsom's wife and it had like something like 60,000 views in like the first like two or three hours, I was like, oh, this is bad. Because, you know, TikTok kind of changed it where you don't get, like, your views really fast anymore. So when the views are that fast, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, this is, this is, people are going to want me dead tomorrow. That's, yeah. My phone's about to get wiped. <laughs> I'm about to get wiped if I don't stop. Um, so, but that's what really made me realize that, like, all the other media outlets were like, she was so brave. And, I mean, yes, you are brave to do that to go on stand and do that story but to completely not acknowledge to feel gaslit by what I actually saw going down and then the media coverage of it and then how all the independent people were like whoa what the fuck was that Amber Heard shit you know and not to even make fun of Amber Heard but obviously we know what happened on the stand stare that off-putting nature that you know they say was borderline personality disorder um, you know, because whatever she got like diagnosed during that trial, if you watched it, it was like borderline personality disorder and then another personality disorder. So I don't know what that was, but that's like very much the vibe that came off. That was very off putting. Um, so that made me realize like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need any of these people's jobs. Sure. I need to make more money, but that's okay because I'm here for the long haul. You know, like I don't want to cover something in a way that is dishonest. So if I think that she's lying and full of shit, unfortunately I have to say that. Um, and it's not because of the hand job thing, because like I said, I understand that. But that really just like taught me like to like, don't chase these jobs that you have thought of in your mind because you don't need them like you're a fucking trailblazer y'all fucking trailblazer you just do this straight to the people and speaking of um i'm also going to be covering something else and i'm going to announce it here just at the end of the video because um only those who waited till the end will get this little juicy um info which is i'm going to be covering the conscious life expo so I'm also going to be a member of the media for that. I'm going to have a media pass. I'm going to get to go to all of the different lectures, all of the different events. And it's literally going to be like everyone's going to be there, like Bashar, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, um, Leo King. I'm excited to see. I love Leo King. Um, everybody, everybody, Elizabeth April, all of the like spiritual teachers and all of these like UFO, alien people, consciousness people, George Nori, George Nori. I got to get an interview with George Nori. Um, so a lot of great things are happening. I have so much to share still. I'm going to do another video um, about the moon book, but I just wanted to like finalize some of this Harvey stuff. I still had some other things to talk about too, which I think I still might do. So even if you're over the Harvey stuff, there is still some other stuff to say. But anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I'm just trying to get back in the swing of being on YouTube more. And thanks so much. I appreciate you guys.